afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am here from uh, Queen's University, Belfast. I am Dr. Kim Marie Seth, and I, I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me to to present in this way. I, you know, had been unable to come largely because I'm a I am a non-EU passport holder, and so that has meant mobility throughout Europe is has become more and more difficult. Uh, so I am here to talk about decolonization as a two-way street, or and I'm speaking about curriculum decolonization. I was recommended to this conference having uh, submitted a paper to a journal about this issue and uh, I think the editor had gotten this call and said you know what you might want to present this for that field. Um, so that will be in the Irish Journal of Arts Management and Cultural Policy later this summer so keep an eye out for it. I look forward to your comments. I have used an Adinkra symbol that speaks to unity and diversity and I feel this is while I say two-way street it's a two-way street, but with, with multiple flyovers, crossovers, etc. Just to, just to highlight the complexity of the relational aspect of decolonization. So, it's that, you know, decolonize, curricular decolonization is a long, long-standing thing. Going back to one of my favorites, Fanon 1963, and even further back, Bordeaux 1990. Uh, but just to give an idea that the discussion around decolonizing curricula did not start in 2020. However, 2020 with the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, and the resurgence of the Black Lives Movement has led to an other rethinking of the embedded and systemic ways in which injustice and marginalization has happened. So I use a, 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 a comment from a coast, a coast on Saturday in Bristol here in the UK where uh, this statue had occupied public space for many years and despite petitions and applications for its removal had not. And Colston was a prominent figure in Bristol, but also um, a slave trader. So the those who were the descendants of slaves had this statue every day as it stood in 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 honor in, in public space. And so it was removed and thrown into um, the harbor. So but these things speak to also an issue of um, curricular decolonization about the systemic nature that it should have. It's more than just putting new names on a list. So, Lutz in 1974 had spoken to the third phase of power, a recognition of the power of shaping the, the narrative and the discourse. We have discussions about the canon. So, in every academic field, from whichever that you all are coming from, you realize there is there are canonic foundational literature and concepts and questions about the representation, the, what is considered and mainstream as the norm, as the ideal, um, as the paradigms in each of these uh, fields. And so, with, um, you know, I looked at writing, uh, no doubt from Milena Jack Desovich, I hope I pronounced that right, I pronounce your name right, uh, talking about the internationalization, the diversification, and the decolonization of different uh, curricula within the arts, management, uh, cultural policy, and creative industry space. We have Joff writing from South Africa, shown from the South Asian space. But there are also questions, not just about the literature and the paradigm, and, but also about who teaches and who is, and who gets to learn. And so we realize multifaceted layer of curricular decolonization. Also, um, speaking in a 2016 
interview guides paper notes the relational aspect of it um with there can be no colonizer without colonized and vice versa and in that relation we realize the the decolonization and the dismantling of colonial uh, hierarchies and framework is also a relational one. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the work on decolonizing the curriculum has been national. So, for example, again, being based in Belfast, I will speak to um, the UK. Uh, there has been a discussion of you know black curriculum and the inclusion of others and the voices of others within um, the, cur the, the curricu curricula writ large. Uh, likewise, uh, so coming from Jamaica, likewise the discussion of decolonization there has also been a representation adding others. But realizing particularly within the realm of higher education where we are members as per the international nature of this very con um, conference, we're members of an international and global contingent within our particular disciplines and fields. And so notions of the canon, notions of um, paradigms cross national and regional lines. And so therefore, in that systemic, in the systemic decolonization, we also need to cross national and regional life. And I would hazard to say not just in our curricula and content, but also in the way we relate to each other. Not as even but the implication it has for institutions. So here I give a and this is inspired by um, my comparing two very different kinds of apples. So I wouldn't say apples, you know, two very different kinds of apples. I work, you know, I'm the subject lead for arts management and cultural policy at Queen's University of Belfast, even while my own specialties are cultural industries of, uh, music industries of K-pop and reggae. And that comparative look at the, at the different policies that are engaged in that. And so I, I therefore, um, you know, my department represents the, the interdisciplinarity, the interconnectedness of the space of arts and cultural management, of cultural policy, and of creative industry. And, and I would have a communication. And so how all the academics within the field write together, work together, share departments, etc. Um, I quote Eva and Colbert uh, from 2000, who were then the chairs of IMAC, which is one of the largest and, and oldest, I think, um, arts management conferences in the world. And they also recognize in their own definition so, of the interrelatedness of these fields. Uh, and so, in my discussion, I am comparing uh, the cultural policy course within arts management and cultural policy here at Queen's University Belfast, and also uh, film, film, study, film economy, film industries course at um, the University of the West Indies. So, I have had the privilege uh, to teach on both courses simultaneously. Uh, so having done, and I should know, you know, something that would be very familiar to Global South scholars of the, having gone, having studied for my PhD on the scholarship, I was bonded to work at home. But those academic jobs did not, there is a dearth of academic jobs, particularly within that space. And so that necessitated leaving the country. But to satisfy the terms of the bond, I teach uh, each year. And so that um, that kind of led to uh, 
realizing that decolonizing curricula in two different spaces require similar and different sensibilities and also a recognition of the relationality between them. Uh, I should know arts and cultural management has its origin story within post-war Europe, post post-World War II Europe, as per the uh, 2019 Paquette and Radiele 2015. And so therefore, in its origin and birth story, it also has been um, the embeddedness of no, very North-centric um, paradigms and continuing academic literature. Uh, given my own uh, case, there's been a, a number of different uh, work written on, particularly in the cultural space, cultural industries, cultural policy, etc., that a lot of the work coming out of the South has not necessarily been coming out in academic journals, but actually in the great literature consultancy reports for people to earn a living. And so there is also that particular aspect. Um, I should also note that I use North and South to, to describe not a binary, but a continuum, rec so an explicit recognition of various le interlacing and multi-layered levels of North and South and, their, and clearly their relation to each other. So I see North and South on a spectrum, not binary. So I taught a film studies course in Jamaica um, within the communications and media school. And uh, the original curriculum had mostly American and then some Western European content. And content refers to academic literature and also reference films and case studies. Our student demographic was Caribbean and mostly Afro-Caribbean, i.e. students of African and Black descent. Uh, I therefore had a number of different means for addressing this issue. Um, one, I sought to, of course, include more Caribbean film industry content and realizing that actually, in terms of academic written content, there was not a lot. And um, the discussion on who teaches rights Because you read with fewer academics in the Caribbean, in this space, there's fewer academic work coming out on the Caribbean in this space. Uh, and so having to, so realizing systemic reasons for the lack of content. Uh, or academic written content. And so uh, utilizing human books as part of the way to balance that out. Uh, human books come from this Danish concept of utilizing human beings, not just as guest speakers, but in the book sense, the, you know, a, a, a more comprehensive engagement with their development paradigms and policy in this discussion, um, especially as we now have culture-led development, creative industries-led development, and other such paradigms, terms, and, and, and terminology in this space. And so again, the importance of a, a global political economy of cultural policy and realizing how the emergence and base of who was there before, who will colonize who, you realize that you don't see offices of ACID in South Africa because they didn't come it's not just a link, the linguistic, one can say, oh, well, it is a linguistic links, but why, do, why does Latin, so much of Latin America speak Spanish? Because of colonial nationality, uh, a history of colonization, and so therefore the, the systemic nature of coloniality continues. The, the response of TUNETS here was actually this combination and panic. Um, based in Belfast, uh, so Belfast is, is the capital of Northern Ireland, and there has been, you know, a long discussion, um, a history of Irish 
or colonization of the Irish. Uh, the Republic of Ireland is a, a result of a, a war for independence. Belfast itself has been through its own civil war with competing sh nationalists, so, i.e. pro-independence from UK and unionists pro-UK um, remaining part of the UK. And so there is a, a awareness of their own colonial space. And so the discussion of Irish um, colonization or colonization of the Irish has also um, <coughs> led to in in popular and mainstream uh, forum led, led to um, non not as much discussions I would say non discussion but not as much focus on um, the, their implication and involvement in the colonization of others, say, for example, Caribbean colonization. And so realizing, because in the discussion of coloniality, I discussed, presented coloniality, not just Western, not coloniality in which Western Europe is implicated, but also Asian coloniality, um, you know, and also, and also um, the multi-layered nature of um, European coloniality, which we discuss things such as Irish and Scottish involvement in um, British colonization. And so there was this combination of panic because then there's a need to reposition and understand that even as one has suffered from colonization, you're implied in others and just the messy nature of coloniality. So what does this mean for a decolonization um, agenda? One, just the need for an explicit inclusion of the relation between reflexivity, reflectivity, a wider thing, a discussion of academic publishing, um, academic um, academic representation. So who gets gets to teach, who gets to write who's published, etc., and where. Um, and then implicated in that is scope for, then what do we do institutionally? There is a possible, that can, while an individual academic like myself can do this kind of work, it's on, can do, it's important to do parts of this kind of work being based in two institutions and being able to use my access to material um, in at Queen's, for example, at Queen's University, to to balance out the lack of material in the in the southern institution in which I'm also um, positioned is unusual and rare. And so that kind of exchange of say written content um, should be cross institutions, but it's not just north to south. Um, you know, also noting the nature of who writes and where they write in the south is also important, as I noted, utilizing great literature, realizing the importance of consultancy work in documentation of documentation and analysis of what is happening in the arts management, cultural policy, creative industry space within the Caribbean and the South. And there have been work written about consultancy um, throughout the African continent and um, uh, Asian continent that really want to know that there are similar issues there about where it is written. And so there's a need also in terms of the search and inclusion of literature in the North to look at the variety of places and positions in the South. Uh, again, continuum, not a binary. And so we have dating from Walter Rodney, Hajun Han, uh, Chang, now to entangle the legacies of empire. We realize that, you know, uh, what is this? This is 1963, 90, 2000, early 2000s, and then 2022, that there has been a notion of this relational level. But it is for, here, I call to action that this is, should be an institutional 
and systemic discussion, not just for individual academic to do the, the work that and, and open the access points. And so, um, you know, as Nlovu uh, Gacheni um, noted, you know, post colonial is yet to be born. It's as if colon colonialism was buried alive and is kicking and screaming. And so I end with examples of these kind of institutional work. You see Birmingham City University and the University of the West Indies, um, which is in the car the car what the premier Caribbean um, regional university bonding together on a regular research project that deals with those issues of who has access to which material, um, finances, etc. And and so thereby enriching the, the cultural studies program within both the university. We also see where the University of Southampton is working with um, a cultural project um, in Jamaica and through that enriching both sides of the curriculum in terms of um, creative practice and cultural policy. And so I say, move that charge up. Yes, I have a unique experience, etc., and and have, have learned from it. But what I've learned from it is it should not be that way that me having to access from or and balance the pros and cons of each position should not be an individual, should not solely be the work of individual academics, but should be part of a partnership between institutions, South, South, North, South, etc. Just along that continuum because colonization was relational and so too should decolonization of the curriculum be. Thank you.